Hey guys, welcome to the first set of video notes for the fish part of this unit. So we're going to first get into some details about just the different types of fish and some structures, and then we'll further discuss the types of fish in a separate video. So first of all, what's the evolutionary evidence? So fish are the first members of phylum chordata that we're going to study, but why are they even in that phylum? Well, they have things like a notochord, pharyngeal slits, dorsal tubular nerve cord, and a postanal tail, all of which are necessary to be classified as phylum chordata. They're in group craniata, which means a skull surrounds their brain, and they're in subphylums, several different ones. So hyperoptreti is fish-like, skull has cartilage bars, they're jawless, or subphylum vertebrata. Both of those subphyla are considered fish. So the first vertebrates were probably marine which means that fish were probably the first vertebrates. They did adapt to freshwater though, because as you know, there's a lot of freshwater fish species, but the evolution, interestingly enough, occurred in freshwater for most fish. So this early evolution involved the movement of fish back and forth between those marine and freshwater environments. And there are still fish today that do that. That's part of their reproduction and how they create more offspring. So the freshwater evolutionary evidence, this is a kind of long quote, but it's really important that you understand this. So it's the importance of fish evolution is evidenced by the fact that 41% of all fish species are found in freshwater. So even though freshwater habitats we know aren't very much of the Earth's water, a majority of the Earth's water is salt water. So the fact that 41% of species are in a freshwater environment speaks volumes in terms of the evolutionary standpoint of fish. So the first subphyla we're going to get into is hyperotreti. Now these are the hagfish and they're similar to what you think of when someone says fish, but they also have some differences. So they are the most primitive living crania, meaning they have a skull surrounding their brain and they have those two key characteristics that they have a brain and they have bones. So 530 million years ago, there's possible fossils with a brain. And then 500 million years ago, bones were well developed in fishes called astracoderms, which is kind of like a bony armor for those fish. So the hagfish itself has a head and a brain. The head is supported by cartilaginous bars, but the brain itself is enclosed in a fibrous sheath. They do lack vertebrae, but they have a notochord, which gives them structure as well. They also have four pairs of sensory tentacles around their mouth, and they have a ventrolateral slime gland. These are very, very slimy animals. Their habitat's typically marine. They do like cold water. In terms of feeding, they like soft-bodied invertebrates, or they do scavenge on dead and decaying fish as well. And interesting, they do this really kind of cool thing. To provide leverage while they're feeding, they will actually tie themselves in a knot and press it forward against the prey as they're feeding, which is shown in that picture below. So now we're going to get into the actual vertebrates. So these are all the other types of fish, subphylum vertebrata. So they have vertebrae, which surround a nerve cord, and this is the primary method of support for these fish. Most of them are members of the superclass Nathostomata, which is jawed fishes and tetrapods. So there's also some, something called astracoderms. Now these are extinct ignathans. They don't have jaws, and they belong to several classes. They were bottom dwellers and they were very sluggish, but they were filter feeders. They did though have a bony armor and they had bony plates around their mouth to act like a jaw. So we're going to talk first about class cephalospinomorphy. Now this means head, shield, form, as you see it broken down. So these were marine and freshwater and the larvae were actually filter feeders. The adults on the other hand, they prey on fish. So they have a mouth sucker-like with lips for attachment, so that's a good close-up of what their mouths look like as they attach to their prey. They use their lips and their teeth, and then the tongue itself rafts away those scales. So these are a parasitic fish. As you see here, they are attaching to the fish, and that's how they get their nutrition. And they have salivary glands with an anticoagulant, and they feed on blood, very similar to leeches, which are worms, but they also have these, they have things in their bodies that make the blood not clot. So there are two types that you need to know of in this class. There's freshwater brook lampreys and sea lampreys. The freshwater brook lampreys, obviously, they live in freshwater. 
Their larval stage itself can last three years and only the adults reproduce. But interestingly, the adults, they never leave the stream after reproduction. They just die. That's where they die. The sea lampreys then live in the ocean or the Great Lakes. Now they're in the Great Lakes partially due to a parasite and some kind of transportation via ships and things like that. So they are causing trouble there. But at the end of the life, they do migrate to a freshwater stream. So they've ended up in those Great Lakes. The females are going to attach to a stone with their mouth, and then the male uses his mouth and attaches to the female's head. So from there, eggs are shed, and the, they're fertilized externally. So here's just an infographic about the reproduction of the lamprey. So they start out here. They're going to seek out areas, and that's where they attach. The eggs then settle then the larvae are going to emerge and drift downstream. They're going to go into silt. After three to five years, they transform. In the spring, the adult ones go back up those streams and rivers to spawn. And then that's after, of course, they're in the lakes and they're feeding. So it's kind of this big cycle. So they go from the stream out to the lake, back to the stream. So they are very similar in that they do inhabit saltwater and freshwater areas like some fish do as well. So the first one we're going to talk about then with jaws is just superclass Nathostomata. So these are our first vertebrates that have jaws. So they evolved from what was thought to be an anterior pair of pharyngeal arches. Now they're very important for two reasons. One, they help with much more efficient gill ventilation, which we'll get into, but they also help with the capture and ingestion of a variety of food sources. So they also have paired appendages. Now this is where we really get into the details of all the different fins that fish have. So they, they decrease rolling during locomotion, they control tilt or pitch, and they also help with lateral steering. So we're gonna draw a fish and we're gonna draw all the parts of it. You're probably gonna wanna pause as we go along, that way you can make yourself a key and kind of label, but I'm just gonna go right through it. So pause as needed. So we're gonna start with a big circle and a mouth and an eye. So the first thing we're going to do is the caudal fin or the tail fin. This is used for forward motion and acceleration. Next, we're going to do the dorsal fin, which is at the top, and the anal fin, which is at the bottom. So both of these are singular fins, they're not paired, and they're used to prevent the rolling and tipping of fish as they swim along. Next up is the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin. So these are paired fins, so they have lefts and rights for each of these fins. And these are used for balance, stopping, and turning. Next up, we have spines. So there's four at the top here, but there's also one at the bottom. Don't miss that one. Those are used for protection, and some of them actually contain poison sacs. That's how some fish protect themselves. Next, we're going to do the operculum, which is number seven there. And that just covers and protects the gills. And then number eight is our lateral line. So just a dotted line. It runs the length of the fish, but it's towards the top of its body. So this is a very important structure on the fish. They're sensory canals, actually, and they're used to detect changes in the water pressure around the fish, which is very similar to our ears. So now when we get into the jaws and appendages, so this also increases that ability for predatory lifestyles. And like we mentioned, more feeding. But more feeding also results in more offspring and the ability to inhabit new habitats because they have a wider range of prey that they can eat. There are two major classes in superclass Nathostomata, so class Chondrichthys, which are the cartilage fish, like that ray you see there, and class Osteichthys, which are the bony fish. And our next video is going to get into the details of both of those.